All right, yeah, so I'm here to talk about parallel I.O. and storage, specifically um, at ALCF. And so before I get started, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge that a lot of the content that I'm about to talk about comes from a lot of different people, especially here at ALCF and at Argon. Um, two people at the top, Kevin Harms and Venkat, uh, they should be around here, and they, they also have a lot of knowledge about um, parallel I.O. and storage. Um, there, is, there are, of course, names that are being left off this list, so a lot of people um, helped. And so as a preview, I'm first going to start with sort of basics of HPC and parallel I.O. Um, this is not going to be totally ALCF specific at the start, but it does, of course, relate. It is relevant to the ALCF systems. And then I'll go into ALCF specific overview and then talk about some optimizations on Mira and more so on Theta and go to conclusions. So HPC I.O. basics, we're talking about the storage and retrieval of persistent data to and from a file system from a software application. Um, and so a couple of key points here that I'm going to go through, that data is stored in a POSIX convention. The HP mach machines use a parallel file system, and the parallel file system gives us an aggregate bandwidth. And so this is, these are basics, but it's worth getting everybody on the same, on the same page. So first off, why are we doing I.O.? Um, there are usually two flavors of I.O. that we see. There is defensive I.O., this also commonly known as checkpointing, this means you're trying to protect the data that you're generating from system failures or software failures. Um, then there is productive I.O. This is, you know, here's an example where the actual application really is visualization. And so, obviously, you need to read in all of the data to actually do the analysis that you're, the visualization and analysis that you need to do. Whereas here on the left, you are just doing an, ex these, um, the, this group's just doing an expensive calculation where they're using electronic structure calculations um, at every step of the simulation, and so it makes sense to, you know, every once in a while checkpoint the electronic structure so you don't have to start from scratch if there is a failure. And so why do we care about the performance of I.O.? Well, this is a great motivation for why we care about performance. Just a, a simple historical plot of the ratio of I.O. performance to compute performance on the top system on the top 500 list. And clearly, the um, performance, the, the I.O. peak performance has not kept pace uh, with compute performance. This just gives you the idea that, let's say you were running some simulation with some amount of I.O. here in 2010 or so. Um, the same simulation would, if you wanted to scale up to the sizes of, you know, leadership scale machines today, you would be spending a large, larger portion of your time probably doing I.O. than you would have before. And so I.O. can become a bottleneck just with the scaling, uh, keeping up with the, the top, top systems. And so how is data stored on HPC systems? Well, it's stored pretty much in the same way that it's likely stored on your laptop um, as far as the user is, is uh, concerned. And what, what I mean by that is there's, it uses a file system. There's a, a structure of, fi of, um, of directories and files where, where everything is um, everything is organized, and a, a single file um, is generally treated in the POSIX convention. What this means is that it's treated as a contiguous stream of bytes, and that's very convenient from the user's perspective, and it's also the way uh, much of the POSIX API for interacting with the file system, um, you know, lets you treat the file as this contiguous stream of bytes. And so, how are things different on HPC machines? Well, the very simple way to think of how they're different is the fact that we have a parallel file system instead of a serial file system. So if you were looking at your workstation, maybe you had some number of cores, um, but it's really interacting directly with a local file system. It might be flash storage, it might be hard disk drive. Um, in HPC systems, like those at ALCF, you generally have your cluster of, com of compute, and then you're interacting with a separate cluster of, uh, of storage devices, and the, you need to have some parallel file system that allows you the, the compute to interact with the different parts of the file system uh, concurrently. And so how are, is this file system managed? Um, there are different popular pile, file systems used in the HPC world. Here at ALCF, we use the GPFS file system and the Lustre file system. And I'll go into details about where those are used. But for either case, um, the machines at ALCF, this is typically the way you should think about how the, where the file system lies on the I.O. path. So you have your, your, your machine 
this is the cluster of compute nodes that are, have some fast interconnect network in between them. Then to go from the compute nodes to your array, your storage arrays, you need to pass through several hops. First, you need to pass through some sort of I.O. forwarding layer. Then that will pass over some external network, which might be shared with other machines. It might be, able, might be connected to dip more than one file system. And then there will be storage nodes that run the parallel file system and, and, and uh, actual disk or actual devices where the storage is actually occurs. And something important to think about is that in, you know, whereas you, you know, on your workstation, your file system is right there on your system, you actually need to take several hops. Of, your data needs to take several hops to get to sto between the compute nodes and the storage. And so there's a, an added latency to, to this. So even though you can store, multiple processes can store on multiple different devices concurrently and give you a nice large aggregate bandwidth, there's still a high latency for interacting with the file system. What this means is that you want to have large um, accesses to the file system. There's a latency for interacting with it, so if you have lots of small interactions, you're going to pay the latency penalty. But if you have a fewer number of large interactions, you're going to get more of that aggregate bandwidth, and this just shows what you should intuitively think. Um, this is using the, uh, a blue gene, an older system, but it's still relevant. Um, it's just showing as the request size goes up, so does the performance, just like you should expect. And so how are the files mapped onto the parallel file system? This is sort of a, a picture that I stole from somewhere else um, from an, an earlier AppPest talk, but it does drive home one point that a file, let's say this checkpoint.h5 file, it's treated in a POSIX convention as a continuous stream of bytes, stream of, a contiguous stream of bytes, but the parallel file system will break that file into extents, or in GPFS they call them blocks, in Lustre we call them stripes, and those blocks or stripes can be distributed to different storage devices. Since we are um, breaking the system up into different blocks or stripes, you also need to think about the fact that, that um, different compute resources may be fighting over those blocks, and so you, you need to, to take this into consideration um, when either you know, a library will take this into consideration for you or you explicitly need to take into consideration that block alignment of your file accesses will, will create less um, false sharing. So uh, I'm going to go into more detail about the, these specific examples. This would be in GPFS where there would be possible false sharing, and here this is in, in Lustre. And this is just to drive home that point that um, the, the block alignment can be very important. As you would expect the block size to go up, you would express, expect the performance to go up, but it's, also, it's more complicated than that because on this system, the BlueGene Q, where you have an eight megabyte block size, clearly whenever, when you have an eight megabyte block size, you get a jump in performance, and then when you have uh, twice that as the, as the access size, you get the best performance. So you, you clearly need to have block alignment to get good performance. And so some parallel I.O. basics. This is actually talking a little bit more about how you would use those parallel file systems. Um, first, I'm going to say don't use file per process unless you're really not using a, running a big uh, system, and I'll talk a little more about what that means. And that it's best to use MPI I.O. or some higher level library that's leveraging, leveraging MPI I.O. And so first, different types of parallel um, I.O. On the left, we have file per process, or FPP parallel. What this means is you might have some number of MPI ranks that's running a simulation or doing some kind of data analysis, and each of them would be interacting with its own dedicated file. This can be fine when you have you know, tens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of, of uh, files, but it doesn't scale, and it, it also leads to a lot of consumption and management issues. You know, after the fact, you're going to need to manage all of those files and kind of collect all that information once again. A shared parallel just means that you have one file and all the individual ranks running in that, that, uh, running that run <laughs> will interact with distinct parts of the file. Um, well, ideally, they would interact with distinct parts of the file. They may also interact with interleaved sections of the file. But this is what shared file parallel means. I also might mention a few times subfiling. Um, it's also good for you to understand that it might, the, the it's not always performant to scale a uh, shared file parallel. We def definitely recommend doing shared file parallel whenever possible, but at the real extreme scales, it is possible that you'll start running into IO bottlenecks. 
And so it tends to be the best possible situation to use subfiling, which means some subset of node, some subset of ranks, maybe it will be each node, maybe it will be a subset of nodes, will write to its own um, dedicated file, but within that file, all of your ranks would be sharing the file. This is, of course, hard to manage yourself, but it's just worth noting that if you are running into, if you're really trying to um, scale to extreme scales and you're running into um, IO bottlenecks, this might be your answer, but it does take some extra work. And so I already mentioned this before, MPI IO. This is really the recommended way to do parallel IO on our systems here. Um, it's you know, sort of the POSIX replacement for, um, or sorry, it's the MPI replacement for POSIX interactions with the file system. It allows you to do what's called independent I.O., which means each rank will independently be interacting with the file system, and, they, and the, the, the different ranks in the communicator don't need to um, collectively participate, whereas collective MPIO means that you're saying, okay, all of the ranks are about to do this read, and they're, or they're all about to do this write, and so under the covers, the MPI implementation, the MPIO implementation might do some optimizations to to allow better access to the file system and better performance. Um, it's also worth noting a lot of people using Python these days, MPIO capabilities are also enabled through something like MPI for Pi. Um, so even if you're using Python, you should be do, using MPIO. And here's just a simple example. I'm not going to go through too much, um, too many details here, but this is pretty much what it looks like if you had a simple code where you had a bunch of ranks that were wanted to write their own section of a 1D array. It looks something like this. You're really doing an MPI file open. Um, I, these gray parts are kind of recommendations of ways you might be able to get even better performance. For example, if you open the file and pre-allocate it beforehand, it lowers metadata overhead. If you set, if you make sure the atomicity is set to zero, you know, that you specify atomic ordering is unnecessary, you might get better performance. And then you just do a write at, the all means collective here. It means all of my all of my my processes are going to be are going to be calling this uh, this function and then MPI file close. So it looks like a lot of other MPI um, excuse me. It looks like a lot of M other MPI functions because that's pretty much what MPI IO is. And so some common optimizations that would be that you would find inside of MPI IO. I'm not going to talk too much about data sieving. But what data sieving does is it says, okay, we get much better performance when we have a large access to the file system. And so what this means is maybe you have a whole bunch of smaller interactions. You, you want to take this chunk, this chunk, this chunk, and this chunk to either write it to the file system or read it from the file system. It might be more performant if you actually read or wrote this entire chunk. And so if you were reading, you would read this entire chunk and then pick out the pieces you wanted. If you were writing, you would actually read back that entire chunk, change the pieces you wanted, and then write the whole thing back. Both of them are sometimes more, more optimal, more performant than just doing their four independent writes here in this case. Then there's two-phase I.O. What th this tries to accomplish two things. It tries to accomplish the same thing as the data sieving in the fact that you want to have larger accesses to the file system, and it also allows you to have contiguous accesses to the file system. This is a case where you have each of your ranks is trying to write kind of in an interleave fashion into the file. And so rather than each rank individually writing separately to different places or reading from different places, you can aggregate your requests onto a subset of your processes and they will actually do the work and then, uh, and then um, distribute the, the information to the other processes. So there are a lot, under, you know, in the MPIO implementation, there are a lot of areas where this can, this uh, two-phase I.O. can be optimized, and I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but this is just showing some different areas of, in the aggregation stage, in the writing stage, um, in the block alignment. These things are all, try, are all tried, the, the MPIO implementation tries to accomplish a lot of these kinds of optimizations for you. And so what does the software stack look like on an HPC system? Well, this is really what it looks, the IO software stack looks like on ALCF in a very cartoon fashion at least, is you have the parallel file system on the bottom, you have the application software, the user application software on the top. You can interact directly with the POSIX, IO to, uh, POSIX API to interact with the file system or with MPIO, which usually interacts with POSIX or some lower level um, or something lower level. And then you have um, 
HDF5, NetCDF, other things, um, <coughs> other higher level libraries that will use MPIO underneath to get good scaling. Here's just another um, kind of example. I'm kind of reiterating that these are examples on ALCF, that um, higher level libraries that will use MPIO for you. So here's my ALCF storage overview. This is just um, to give you a basic idea of what is available here at ALCF. The first thing I'm going to say is to make sure if you're doing something where you need good performance, so if you're running production, you want to use projects, uh, the project space. You don't want to use your home directory because that is not going to be the production file system. It's not, it, it might be a parallel file system, but it's not a production file system. And here's another view of the whole um, ALCF, um, of the ALCF resources. In the boxes here, I'm showing the two main production file systems. Uh, on Theta, you're going to be interacting, you would be interacting with the Luster file system. On Mira, you would be interacting with this GPFS file system called Mira FS0. Here's just more information for your reference. And like I said before, uh, important consideration is to use the projects directory. Also, storage space is managed by project quotas. That means the files are not going to be purged for you. Uh, instead, it's up to the user to make sure that you are managing your own space by deleting files that you no longer need. It's also worth noting that the project um, directory is not backed up. So it's, you want to make sure that you are moving data out that you want to keep yourself. Um, it's not likely that you would lose the data, but you, it's up to you to protect it. So now I'll go briefly through Mira. This is what the, the general overview of the Mira infrastructure looks like. What's worth noting is that you, um, on the, for, yeah, so for the Mira I.O. path, you will be passing through first bridge nodes that are directly connected to I.O. or gateway nodes, and those I.O. gateway nodes are then connected through a, um, a shared InfiniBand network to your file, GPFS file systems. There's a 128 nodes to one I.O. Um, ratio. And something else that's convenient to know is that if you're running on at least 512 nodes, you actually have a dedicated I.O. resources. So if you're testing I.O. performance, you, it's much easier to do so on Mira than it is to do on Theta because you can get a, sort of an isolated I.O. Uh, performance without getting noise from other jobs that are running. So like I mentioned before, on uh, Mira, we use an uh, IBM's general parallel file system. And this is, uh, this is reiterating a lot of the other information that I already mentioned, so I'm going to pass through this. On Mira, um, you have great um, MPI-IO support. So it is, it is highly optimized for the Blue Gene Q, um, and it's, it's also, um, uh, yeah, the, and there are all of the, the HDF5, NetCDF, you know, these higher level libraries are all available. You can look in soft libraries. Um, these should all perform relatively well. One note of caution is that MPIO scales well, but it can, it can generally break when you get to really large scales because it can run into memory issues. Um, I'm going to mention on the next slide some workarounds for that, but if you really are running into memory issues, you can talk to ALCF staff and we can try to work with you. Some important MPIO recommendations is that you do want to use collective IO on MPI, I mean on, um, on uh, the Blue Gene Q system or on Mira. Um, you want to use collective I.O. It, it performs very well. You'll notice how I, I might say for theta that it's not always the best answer, but it's generally the first place to start on both systems, but it's, it, it behaves very well on Mira. But you also want to set, um, you want to, um, set this environment variable, um, generally get the best performance by, by disabled blocking in the blue gene ADIO um, layer. When I say ADIO, this is... This is an um, abstract device layer within MPI that, that is sort of optimized for the specific file system. And so this is here for your reference. There is other tuning you can do. At the bottom, you'll see that th these are ways that you can deal with uh, memory issues if you're running out of memory. I promised I would come back to this. This is, this is um, for GPFS. What you need to understand is that if you have multiple ranks, that are trying to access the same file system block, and they happen to be using different I, passing through different I/O nodes, you might get um, block 
lock extent contention. So rank A would get access to the entire block and lock out block B until lock A released the lock, or rank A released the lock, and then B would get access. And this sort of serializes the whole process. What's good to notice is that if you're using collective MPIO, this should be taken care of for you. So it's another reason that you would use MPIO libraries. There are also performance tools available on MIRA. I'm going to go into some examples, especially for Darshan on Theta. So this is here for your reference. Okay, so now for Theta. This is, once again, for your reference to get a good idea of the system overview on Theta. What you need to know is that there are LNet nodes distributed throughout the system. There are, I believe, a total of 30 LNet nodes, and it was the L, it's the LNet nodes that you interact with the file system through. So for Luster, you're actually running, the Luster um, client is actually running on the compute nodes, but all of the IO calls then need to be passed through these LNet nodes. And here's a better, a, a more simplified view of what the Luster actually looks like. Like I just mentioned, the clients actually run on the compute nodes, but you can also think of these as the LNet nodes where all IO calls need to pass through. You then go through what's called a metadata server, MDS, where it will be storing metadata about files and, and, and directories and the metadata target. And then you have your array of different storage targets. So an OST means object storage target. These are your disks. Each, each OST belongs to one or more, or, or sorry, belongs to an object storage server where, your, where the, the Luster, um, the file system um, soft, soft, which manages access to the, to the OSTs. So let's see. I wanted to say that, okay, so what we, th these are just some statistics, uh, or just some specifications. Um, for you to know, the total write bandwidth and, and the read bandwidth are 172 gigabytes and 240 gigabytes per second, respectively. This is if you are, are using the, the entire system writing to all, writing to or reading to all of the OSTs and writing and, or reading a, a lot of data. You are unlikely to get near these levels or, or all the way up to these levels, but you can get a good fraction of them if you're doing good, you're, you're, you're doing good I.O. Something else to notice, if you're just using one OST, the peak performance is actually only six gigabytes per second. But in practice, you might see that you're getting much better performance than this. And that would be because Luster does a great job of what's called client-side caching. Um, so if you're writing, it will tell you it's done with the write as, as long as it's already taken care of all of the, it, it's taken care of, of um, concurrency between all of your all of your, 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 your processes, and it might as well have written all of, all of the data to the file. Um, also, it can, for reading, it, can, it does read ahead, so if it, it can guess that you're about to read more data in the right location, it can give you better performance. Oh, I'll also mention that there are a total of 56 OSSs and one OST per OSS. This means you have 56, uh, you, can, you can write to 56 different object storage targets at the same time, or read from. So how are files broken up into stripes? I mentioned that there are blocks in GPFS and there are stripes in Luster. The striping is done round robin and it's completely up to the user how they want to do the striping. Um, well, there are two parameters that, that are mostly, that you're really allowed to use. The stripe count, so this is the number of stripes before you loop back around, and the stripe size, this is the size of the stripe. So let's say you have an eight megabyte file and you have a one megabyte stripe size, then if you have a stripe count of equal to one, you'll be using only one OST. It'll be randomly assigned to you which OST you're actually using. And all of the stripes in your file will belong to that one OST because you have a stripe count of one. If you have a stripe count of four, then you'll be using four different object storage targets and you'll be looping three, you'll be looping, you'll still have eight stripes, um, total stripes in your file, but the stripe count of four means that's how many OSTs you're using. And for eight, every stripe in your file belongs to a different OST. So note that the, um, the default for the stripe size is one megabyte, just like I use in this example, and the default count is one. 
There are, there's also, in order to, inter to actually um, make these settings and to check what the settings are, you can use the LFS utility. So this is the main Lustre file system utility that's exposed to the user. Um, here are some examples of some, of some different commands you can use. I'll go through a, um, some useful ones on the next slide. First of all, if you wanted to, for example, just see, use LFS DF, you could do that right now and look, and look at um, the, the disk usage. For example, this shows that there are four metadata data targets that are in use, but, oh, there are four metadata targets available, but there's only one of them that, that use, and it's at 3% of its capacity. And then it will go through and show the different OSTs, object storage targets. And right when I took my, at least when I ran this example, they were all about 34% full. Okay, and so here is an example that's going to be useful for you. This is how you actually determine, or how you set the Lustre Stripe settings for your, um, for the directory you're working in. And it's important to note that the defaults are not optimal for large files, so you will want to, to actually go through and learn how to make these changes. What you need to know is that you use a dash S to set the size, dash C to set the count, and then you would specify which, which directory or file you want, want to change. There's usually which directory. So um, that's, for this example, I made a directory called stripe count four, size eight. I set the stripe to four, size to eight, and, set, and I specified inside of that directory I just made. And then if I type LFS get stripe for that directory, it will list exactly what the stripe count and the stripe size is, just so I can, you know, sanity check, make sure I'm doing this correctly. LFS get stripe, kind of the reverse, you're just asking, um, I, I guess I just showed this example down at the bottom, get stripe. It's just showing you what the striping is for the directory or the file that you're asking about, just so you can, what's that? Oh, that's a good question. You know, megabytes, uh, gigabytes are, uh, usually when I'm talking about a large file, I'm talking about gigabytes. Um, and then, yeah, when you, when you get smaller than that, I guess it can, it's a little bit more gray. Okay, so some important notes about file striping. Um, I already said you want to make sure you're using your project space, but it was worth reiterating here. Um, don't set the stripe offset. You'll notice in LFS, you can set the offstrip or which OST you want to start striping at. You want to let the Lustre choose where, which OSTs it's picking, um, which, which OSTs to give you so that it can, it can balance everything and make sure it's not choosing anything slow. Um, the stripe count can't exceed the number of OSTs, so you can't set it to more than 56 on theta. And, and the striping cannot be changed once a file is, is created. So you actually need to recreate the file or you need to change the stripe settings in a new directory and then copy the file over that new directory. The striping is inherited from the, um, of a file is inherited from the directory settings that it's created in. Now, if you're using Cray MPIO, you can also export you know, a, a MPIO hints string, which can specify the striping units and striping factor of a file that you're working with. Um, this might be able, you know, the, the Romeo, or sorry, the MPIO implementation might be able to use this information to, to optimize um, the performance. You can also use other, other met methods for directly setting the stripe size, and there's an example shown right here, or listed right here for your reference. Here's some general luster striping guidelines. If you're using a large shared file, we usually find that using between eight and 48 um, stripes is usually your best, um, usually gives the best performance. We say not to go all the way up to 56 just because it, it can be the case that some OSTs are underperforming and you can let Lustre choose, leave those, uh, those OSTs out. Um, also, yeah, the size using between eight, you usually want to use more than one megabyte when you're talking about large files. If you're doing file per process or you have small files, using one stripe is fine. Cray MPIO, um, I already mentioned that we are recommending you use MPIIO or a higher level library whenever possible. On Cray, or on um, Theta, Cray MPIO is, is, is king, so you have to understand how Cray MPIO behaves in order to get good parallel performance. Um, useful, a useful resource is this man intro MPI. It will list all the different environment variables and, and, and documentation about it. I, I find that useful a lot. Um, also, we have modules for for HDF5 parallel and NetCEF parallel, 
that will be using the Cray MPIO underneath. If you're using, you can also use MPI for Pi, like I mentioned before, or H5Pi. These will also use MPIO, Cray MPIO underneath. Um, so if you're, if, when you're working, I, I mentioned before that if you typed in this, um, this man intro MPI at the top, you can get a lot of information about ways to tune the performance and set different environment variables. Here's an example of some that you can use for optimizing uh, collective buffering, which is the two-phase I.O. that I mentioned before. For example, you can set CB nodes, which will change the number of aggregator nodes that you want to use. Um, and you can set CB nodes multiplier, which will multiply the number of, so you, the number of aggregator um, ranks that you would be using would just be CB nodes multiplied by your CB nodes multiplier. So I'm showing that total aggregator, CB nodes multiply, CB nodes multiplier. You can also change the CB buffer size, um, but that's only if you're using Romeo. It's actually ignored by Cray for right now. Um, but something that's worth noting, um, CB align equal to two. So MPitch MPIO CB align equal to two is the default. That means you're going to use the MPIIO version uh, the, no, sorry, Cray's version of MPI IO. Um, if you set this to be three, it will use the open source um, Romeo version. Um, this isn't recommended for production IO, but if you are curious about why something that you're doing collective IO and it has weird performance, seems really slow, sometimes it's worth changing this to three and then rerunning it and seeing if it's because Cray has some optimization that just is backfiring for your specific case. And then it you can always share that with us or share that with Cray, and that's always useful to know. And so extent lock contention in, um, on theta is very similar to GPFS. Um, and, and it really has, it, it occurs when two or more ranks come across the same file OST combination. And so one way to, to avoid serializing the access to the same stripe is to use Cray CB write lock mode equal to one, yeah, lock mode two is not yet supported, but if you allow the lock mode equal to one, meaning you know that you're not going to be messing this up, your code isn't going to be accessing the same exact data, you can relax the locking um, conventions for when you're writing so that you should get better performance. So I just, before I go into um, kind of different ways of profiling, I'll talk a little bit about Darshan and things like that. It's worth noting that Cray gives you a whole bunch of environment variables that will return a lot of statistics and performance counters for you, and these may be very useful if you're running into I.O. problems. I'm listing them here. Um, at the top, you have MPitch, MPIO, stats equal to one and two. These are two different levels of just returning statistics that are, that are collected by Cray MPIO. Um, then there's timers. Timers is, if you're doing collective I.O., timers can be very useful. It'll, it'll break down and itemize where it's, where all the time is going during the collective I.O. call. So if you're, if you think, oh, is this spending all the time in the actual write, or is it all the time in the communication, this, this, uh, this environment variable can tell you that. Also, if you want to know where the aggregators, how, which, which ranks are chosen for aggregators, aggregator placement display will give that to you. Um, and like I already mentioned before, there's the MPitch MPIO CB align. Um, you could change this to three if you want to check how the Romeo implementation would perform with, compared to um, com compared to uh, Cray MPIO. And so, beyond those uh, environment variables, um, there's also Darshan. Um, Darshan is a great lightweight tool. It's turned on by default. So if you're running a C, C++, Fortran code, and you want to know, you want to get an idea of where, what, where your time was spent doing I.O., um, you can really just, it's, it's already turned on by default, so what you would need to do is just look in the directory um, that's labeled with this convention here. You look in logs, Darshan, theta, the year, month, day, and you should be able to find, um, you should be able to find your Darshan file name there. Then if you have, the text slide loaded, you can then um, create a PDF with a, a summary of the, of the um, I.O. behavior. And it will look something like this. This is, um, you know, I got ellipses here showing there's a lot more information that's available, but it will pretty much break down the, uh, it'll break down what happened in a very easy to consume way. It'll list, you know, POSIX, MPI I.O., standard I.O., um, 
and it'll show you dif the difference between if you have independent calls spent doing independent I.O. versus collective I.O. And so this can be very useful. Uh, one uh, word of caution is uh, if you're doing some, tr if you're doing tricky things with MPI, uh, Darshan can often cause problems. So for example, if you're trying, uh, Darshan will, uh, it's wrapping all the MPI calls. So if you are using, writing your own library or working on your own code that's also wrapping the MPI calls, you might actually not be able to use Darshan because you would have to have it turned off. So this is kind of an aside, but it's worth noting that, if you, that you might not always be able to use it. Okay, so now a little bit about performance. Yeah, so Lustre performance, I'm just going to go through some simple examples of, of, of what we've measured so far, uh, or lately on Lustre. Um, before I say that, it's worth noting that I think I'm, I'm showing mostly just the best case scenario for a lot of these measurements. So we did a bunch of runs and we took the best case to kind of give you an idea of how good it can be. Um, a, a better way to do it usually is to run it a whole bunch of times and take runtime statistics like the max, min, mean, median. Um, this is because there is, you know, noise on the less the, we call it network jitter, um, it can have a huge effect on, on the I.O. performance. And so if you just run something one time, um, you don't really have a great idea of how well that, that would perform on average. So it's good to actually do, run it many times. So I mentioned earlier that Lustre does um, caching um, to give you better performance if you don't really need to get the data all the way to the file system or if you can yeah, it's, it's pretty much if you don't need to get the data all the way to the file system, caching can, can, can um, you don't need to go all the way to the file system because Lustre is taking care of, the, of it for you, then you, you can get some really nice performance enhancements. So first, we're starting with client-side caching disabled here. Um, we're running IOR, which is just a simple IO benchmark with a 1D array. And this is showing, you know, you're, if you're using one OST, eight OST, 16, and within each OST, what the, the stripe size is from one to 32 megabytes. And it shows that for this large, um, we're talking about 256 nodes with 16 processes per node, um, independently writing or reading to a file, um, you get the best performance here, like I mentioned before, around 48 plus OSTs, and we're using about eight megabyte stripes or larger. If you turn caching on, you means you let Lustre take care of a lot of uh, kind of you let, you let Lustre use caching optimizations, then it turns out it doesn't really matter how many OSTs you're using for this specific example. And this doesn't mean you should be using one OST um, because you, your data pattern might not allow caching to take advantage of, of I, to give you all the same advantages for your application, but it's just giving you the idea that Lustre caching gives you, um, gives you an, a, nice, a nice boost and it's worth knowing that, that if you get really unusually good performance, it might have to do with that. And then here is collective I.O. So I was talking about, I was showing independent I.O. here. You'll notice collective I.O. on the right, the best performance, you know, ranges from 10 gigabytes per second for the read, or for the write, and all the way up to about 80 for the read. It's actually quite a bit better for independent in this case. So like I mentioned before, um, collective I.O. usually gives you a nice performance uh, boost on Mira. On Lustre, for very sort of some kinds of accesses, it doesn't actually give you anything, um, and, and so it's worth knowing you shouldn't just by default turn on collective I/O all the time. You should check whether independent or collective is going to give you better performance. Um, this is showing that, um, like I mentioned before, you can use more than you use a node. Uh, um, you can use this this uh, lock setting here up on the right. I, I added it here. Uh, no, I didn't. So if you set, if you use shared locks, this is just showing that you can multiply the number of aggregators that are writing to the, and so you'd have more than one aggregator writing to the same um, stripe, um, or, or kind of fighting over the same stripe. But if you're using shared locks, then you can still get, uh, you know, a linear improvement with the performance with respect to the number of aggregators you're using. So it might, it, it might be worth setting CB nodes multiplier to a larger value manually through um, environment variables as long as you have shared locks turned on and you're making sure you're not fighting over the exact same data, but just the same stripes. The other example is kind of made a collective I.O. look bad, but it is, but those were very simple benchmarks. An IOR benchmark is just a 1D array and each rank is writing to its own portion of the 1D array. Um, 
this is an example on E3SM benchmark where all ranks are writing to, or writing to and reading to all stripes. In this case, you'll see that the collective performance for both read and write is just much better than independent. So you, you, you know, just because I showed you that example before where independent was good, it doesn't mean that, you, that independent's always better. And here's an example of HDF5 using uh, a, an exerciser benchmark that we created. This is again showing that sometimes um, it's better. So on the top, you have collective. Um, and on the bottom, you have independent for different stripe settings. For the write, collective is better. For the read, collective is worse. So it might also differ between reading and writing, whether independent or collective um, gives you better performance. Last thing worth noting is um, that on Theta, we have local, there are, there are node local SSDs. So on each um, node, there is an SSD of 128 gigabytes. Um, you can use these, yeah, so I, I said 128 gigabytes. You need to be granted access to these. So in order to, to if you think you need to use them, you just have to ask. Um, you send an email to support. Um, and then you can look, uh, you can go to this website. It will have a lot more information if you know you don't remember what I'm saying now. Um, it's useful information. You can use this to store local intermediate files. If you're writing a lot of small temporary files, it can be useful to use the, the local SSDs. Um, you know, if you want to untar something, um, probably better to do it on a local SSD than to try to untar a whole bunch of files on the parallel file system. It's also worth mentioning that this is not a burst buffer, like like there are other systems. This is this is, is only accessible to the local um, node. Can only access its local SSD. Um, you and in order to actually use it, once you have um, permission, of course, you would just set an an attributes um, a flag in your Cobalt script asking for SSDs are required. You can also set the size you need, but it shouldn't be necessary. Um, and this is where the SSD will be mounted. You'll see it on local, scratch, on the compute nodes. Just take into account that if you are running an interactive job and you want to see what's on your local SSD, you can't actually access it through the mom node. You would have to SSH into the compute node that you're using to see what's on the, um, on the local SSD. And so the last thing I'll say here is that the um, this is the approximate performance that you'll get on the SSDs. You can scale it up to two processes or so. Um, you'll notice this isn't a huge, a wonderful performance, um, but at scale, it can do better than the Lustre file system. So for example, you'll see here where we're writing to the SSD and reading from the SSD. Um, when you have small data sizes, you're much better than Lustre for the write and for the read. As you get to larger data sizes, they kind of come together. But in this case, where we're using 1,000 nodes, um, you're doing better than Lustre for all of those different sizes. If you go down to 256 nodes, some of the time for different, for the larger uh, data sizes, um, you would be doing better with Lustre. But so this is the keeping account. It's it's at scale that you can use the SSDs for um, you know production uh, or large scale I/O um, as long as they fit on the SSDs. Um, but then at lower scales, it would really just be because you're you're dealing with small files or things like that. And so. I'll wrap it up. Um, uh, yeah, I guess the takeaways are that high performance um, on both Mir and Theta require MPIO or a higher level library, or at least that's what is recommended. Uh, if you want to get good performance on Theta, you need to choose your striping appropriately, use Cray MPIO and play with the optimizations, or use a higher level library and play with the um, different flags. Um, also, if you fall into one of these categories where you have a lot of small files or you, you think you can read or write data will fit on the SSDs, um, and it's worth it to you, you might be able to get better performance. Um, so with that, uh, I'll take any questions you have. Yeah. So yeah, you're definitely going to get an improvement because, uh, so there is an, let's say you, you were writing to a lesser file system with no um, network contention at all, and then a lesser system with network contention. You're right that you are getting that advantage. Um, in this case, you're actually comparing to Luster with a huge advantage of this is read caching for sure. You can't possibly get near 800 gigabytes per second on Luster um, unless you're you're taking uh, unless you're taking you know, caching into account. So I mean, both of these cases have a lot of advantages going for them. I, I don't know if I'm answering all of your questions really, but you're comparing to 
in this case, you're comparing to Lustre. Um, these are both really good performances for Lustre um, that you're comparing to it. So it's not like a straw man in this case or anything like that. No, yeah. I didn't mean it that way. Is that usually, as other question asked today, my issue is to do with workflows that do a lot of I.O. And usually my stopping point is when the system administrator tells me that uh, last, uh, uh, you know, the metadata server oh, yeah. is going offline. So that's a good point. I don't think I said enough about metadata servers today. Or the metadata. So on, on Lustre, on our, on our um, yeah, sorry, on our Theta system, there is one metadata server um, that's actually being used. And so all everybody has to share the same metadata server. Metadata traffic can definitely have a huge effect on file creates, you know, if you type in ls. Um, you know, things like that. You might notice that if the, if the metadata server is getting hammered at that moment, you might sit there and go, why is LS taking so long? Well, that's the, the reason why. And so metadata, you know, anytime there, you need to um, manage metadata between lots of different processes, that can be a bottleneck for Lustre. And that won't be the case here for your local SSD. So that's a huge advantage. Right, yeah. Yeah, point. and and just to add for this performance, you need to use multiple threads to get um, the highest write performance, that's what we've seen in the past. Uh, so you need at least two to four threads per node to get uh, close to the peak, at least with the SM951s, close to the 1.5 gigabytes per second write performance. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Now you talked before about uh, profiling for Fortran or C. How about workflows or Python, big script where you have thousands or tens of thousands of files? Yeah, if you're using, so if you're using Cray MPIO in, you know, underneath, then using some of, the, you know, <coughs> using the, the profiling, Cray's profiling flag should pick that up. You know, yeah, it should pick that up. Um, and so that would be my first place to look if you're, if you're doing IO and you, you want to, you know, look at statistics and timers. Um, some of these other, you know, Darshan, Darshan shouldn't, um, won't, pick it, won't pick it up, I believe, um, unless you're, yeah, so that would be my place to start. And then if you're running, if you're having problems, would, I'm happy to look into the, yeah, to look into the best thing to do. Please. Yeah, I have a question about the SSD. Uh, uh, related question. So, uh, I believe the each KNL load has 196 DDL uh, RAM. So, is it possible someone use uh, the RAM space as a temporary uh, disk before using SSD? Yeah, you can use. So, for example, I don't, I don't, I don't know how the, how we configure, but the, for example, uh, Devsh MAM or Temp. Can you use uh, that that folder as a uh, uh, local uh, RAM RAM disk? Something yeah. Like that? So I'm not sure if I'm totally understanding, but I, I did. You're right. I didn't mention in here that you can have the the, the RAM um, mounted as a as a disk, and you can treat it like a like a disk. Um, I, I should probably add examples like that. Um, um, yeah. If you have questions, so I don't have information because I haven't done that, but I don't have information on the top of my head. But I we that, that's definitely something you can do. So please do reach out to us if you want to do it. 